something to know about Unit 12 is that in this unit we are combining the government and the economics. And one of the ways that we're able to do that is by skipping any kind of vocabulary review. You've learned this stuff all before. We've covered the vocab for uh, government and economics twice already this year, and you covered this to a large degree in sixth grade as well. So no vocabulary review this time. All right, topic one, governments of Southern and Eastern Asia. Here are our standards all tied to um, standard SS7CG4, compare and contrast various forms of government. And um, this is specific to element A. So we're gonna go over the notes that you took for governments of Southern and Eastern Asia. So pause the video and go dig out that graphic organizer that you were working on so we can go over your answers. Okay, first up is the People's Republic of China. Now, China has an autocratic system of government. It's a dictatorship that they call a communist state. Now, it is um, fairly common for communist countries to have more of an oligarchic system of government, but um, China, China's leader more recently has really taken them towards an autocratic system. So we would really consider China autocratic. One thing to keep in mind, even though China has a communist form of government, they do not have a communist economy anymore. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So some more information about China. For form of leadership, for form of leadership, China has a, well, they call, they call their uh, dictator a president, but he is, he is a dictator. Uh, Legislature-wise, they, they do have a thing called the People's National Congress. It's uh, sort of elected, but it really it's, it's controlled by the Communist Party. So it's not, really, um, it's not really a legislature in the usual sense. Now, um, interestingly, you do technically get to vote in China. However, However, those elections are all controlled by the Communist Party. It's what's uh, called a one-party state. So while you technically get to vote, who's on the ballot is determined by the Communist Party. So it's not really voting. It's not really voting because you don't get to choose who you're voting for. And in terms of personal freedom in China, you don't really have uh, personal freedom. There's no political freedom. There's no freedom of speech, no freedom of the media. You're not allowed to criticize the government. Remember what happened in Tiananmen Square when people criticized the government? Um, so personal freedoms are very, very limited in China. Um, there are economic freedoms that we'll talk about later, but personal freedoms, you don't really have those in China. Next up is the Republic of India. So India, of course, is democratic. They have a parliamentary system of government. Um, they call themselves a federal republic, which is, which is accurate. Um, but uh, more accurately, we can describe them as a parliamentary democracy. And by the way, India is the largest democracy in the world. So let's uh, talk some more details here. So they do have a prime minister. Um, and because India, remember that in uh, most uh, parliamentary systems, you have some ceremonial head of state as well. So India also has a ceremonial president in addition to their prime minister. Their parliament is bicameral. There's two, uh, two houses of their parliament, a council of states um, that is uh, somewhat analogous to our Senate where you have uh, members appointed by, by state in India. Um, serving six-year terms, and the People's Assembly, which is analogous to our House of Representatives, in which um, members are elected by population. Um, voting rights in India, standard standard voting rights for any, uh, like any democracies, universal suffrage at age 18. Um, because they're parliamentary, the citizens vote for their representatives for the parliament, the, the People's Assembly, not directly for the prime minister. And India does have a history of free and fair elections. And likewise, India has a pretty good history of personal freedoms um, with freedom of speech, freedom of the media, and freedom to criticize the government. Currently, um, the religious freedoms are somewhat curtailed in India right now, especially if you're a Muslim. But um, other than that, uh, India does have a very good track record in terms of voting rights and personal freedoms. On to Japan. 
So um, if you notice our icon here, um, it's a little bit different from some of the others that we've uh, seen before. So Japan is a democratic country. It is democratic. Um, and their system of government is actually a constitutional monarchy. There is a monarch in Japan, but um, he is purely ceremonial. Um, in actual function, in actual function, uh, Japan functions as a parliamentary democracy, but with the ceremonial monarch. So remember, of course, the leader of the government is the prime minister and uh, the emperor is the ceremonial chief of state. Japan calls its parliament the diet. That's, well, Japanese for parliament. Um, it's bicameral. There's a house of counselors elected to six year terms. Uh, again, this is another similar to uh, similar to our Senate uh, and a house of representatives proportionally elected to four year terms for voting rights. Japan has an outstanding track record on voting rights. Uh, in fact, women were able to vote in Japan from uh, from the get go of their current constitution. So um, you have universal suffrage, all the normal democratic voting rights. And of course, you're not voting for the prime minister, you're voting for your representatives in the parliament. And um, they've got all the standard personal freedoms, including, by the way, equal rights for men and women written directly into their constitution. Okay, next up is South Korea. Um, South Korea is democratic and they have a presidential democracy. So for form of leadership, of course, they have a president. He's, you know, he is elected to a five-year term. Um, they also have someone with a title of prime minister. Okay, now it's a, it's a presidential democracy, not a parliamentary democracy. So the prime minister is not the leader of the country. In South Korea, the position of prime minister is kind of sort of like a vice president. Um, their national assembly is unicameral. Uh, it's a unicameral uh, one house national assembly with 300 members elected to four year terms. Um, voting rights. Uh, one small variation from the, the normal is that the universal suffrage starts at age 19. So you have to be 19 to vote in South Korea. Um, just very, very slightly different than um, than what's what's most common. Um, but they South Korea, especially in, in the last decades, has an excellent track record of free and fair elections. Uh, and of course, being presidential system, the citizens are voting both for the president and their um, and their legislators, members of the National Assembly. Um, South Korea also has a very, very good track record of personal freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of, the, freedom of the media, you're allowed to criticize the government. And there's actually a very strong emphasis on political rights and government accountability in South Korea. This is a, an outstanding, outstanding democracy. All right, before we talk about North Korea, I need to remind you, um, need to remind you that sometimes countries aren't always truthful in their name. So um, that, that kind of reminds me about social media. You know, um, you probably know that people aren't always, uh, shall we say, honest in their social media profiles. So, um, for example, if you were to come across, say, a Facebook profile, and you might have someone with a username like this, say, Big Tom 28. And then if you you look at this uh, person's uh, in profile information, they, you might see that they list themselves as 28 years old. Their occupation is NFL quarterback and, you know, talk about what they drive and you know, talk about the top of the line Cadillac Escalade. And I think you can probably assume that in many cases, the information in a social media profile is, of course, lies lies. Um, if we were to try to get the real information about uh, Big Tom 28, this is what we would find out. Eh, his name actually is Tom, but he's not big and he's not 28. Um, in fact, his actual age is 47. His actual occupation is not NFL quarterback, but burger flipper. And this man does not drive a Cadillac Escalade. No, uh, that right there is a 1988 and a half Ford Tempo. So let me get to the point on this one. North Korea calls itself the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And, uh, you know, if you were to ask them, you know, what uh, what 
uh, are some of their real stats. You know, you know, they would present their leader as a beloved president and dear leader, Kim Jong-un. And for type of government, a, a happy democracy. But I think you know darn well that that is a lie. The real information. So if we were to look at the reality for North Korea, well, I, the name Korea is, is still accurate. Um, obviously, we are not looking at a happy democracy, uh, but a dictatorship. And yes, the, uh, the real leader is evil dictator Kim Jong-un. So citizen participation, of course, is going to be autocratic and their type of government is a dictatorship. Wait until you get to the next part. So for um, for leaders, technically North Korea has three leaders. The president is Kim Il-sung, the chairman is Kim Jong-il, and the dictator or supreme leader is Kim Jong-un. Except you notice two of these leaders are dead. See, Kim Il-sung is Kim Jong-un's grandfather, and Kim Jong-il is his dad. Technically, the uh, two of the leaders of North Korea are, 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 are dead people. They are, North Korea is technically ruled by dead men. All right, so uh, the supreme leader, of course, is the title for the dictator. Um, this is in North Korea inherited from your family. I know this sounds like, a, um, like it might be a monarchy of some sort, but they... Don't, they don't have royal titles, so still calling him a dictator. Now, uh, as far as legislature is concerned, there is no real legislature. There's a group of there's a group of the body there of the Communist Party called the Supreme People's Assembly, but um, these people are controlled by the dictator, so it's not really a legislature. Um, interestingly, you do re vote in North Korea. In fact, you are required to show up to vote. But there's only one name on the ballot, and the ballot is not a secret. There's uh, soldiers in there in the um, in the voting booth with you, so it's not a real vote. It's a fake vote. Uh, and in North Korea, you have no personal freedom. This is in fact the most oppressive country in the world. Um, in addition to having no freedom of speech, no freedom to criticize the government, no freedom of the press, um, there are widespread reports of people being tortured and placed in concentration camps. And to make things even weirder, more extreme, the citizens are expected to worship their leaders like like the leaders are gods. It, this is this is a very 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 um, tough place to live. It's probably the most oppressive country in the world. Okay, on to topic two. Topic two is the economies of Southern and Eastern Asia. And these are all tied to uh, standard SS7E7, analyze different economic systems. All right, I'm going to give you a moment to dig out your notes on the economic systems of Southern and Eastern Asia. So go ahead and find that and pause the video. I'm going to go ahead and pause the video while you do that. You're back. All right, great. So um, remember that in our standards, we're supposed to understand the type of economic system that each country has. We're supposed to be able to answer those three um, ec big economic questions. What to produce? how to produce, for whom to produce. And we should understand something about the role of entrepreneurs in each of these countries. Now, as we go over the notes here, if we go over your answers, don't worry if your answers don't line up precisely with the answers that we have on here. I'm not worried that you um, know all these word for word exactly. We're not memorizing this. We wanna make sure that you understand um, the concepts and that you understood uh, what we were learning in the readings that you did. All right, so let's start with Japan. So Japan, of course, does have, well, they all have mixed economies, but Japan's uh, economy is clearly leaning heavily towards the market side there. North of 70%, I believe it's around 73% um, economic freedom the last time we checked, um, but lots of economic freedom in Japan. Um, their main products include high-tech goods, cars, aircraft, 
um, as far as what to produce. Now, how to produce, uh, how they're able to produce is they have an extremely well-educated workforce and highly advanced technology in their factories. Uh, Japan is one of the most automated economies in the world. Um, they've had to rely on this workforce um, for a long time because they, they're not a country with a lot of natural resources. So they've really had to lean on the education of their workers. For whom to produce, uh, Japan is a very much an export-oriented economy for good reason, for good reason. Uh, and they export mostly to the United States and to China, but also, also to Europe as well. Um, in terms of entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship is highly encouraged in Japan. Highly encouraged, uh, especially if you are an entrepreneur who lives, you know, a Japanese entrepreneur. Um, they're not as free with entrepreneurship in terms of agriculture, right? especially um, they don't really allow foreign investment in their agriculture. Um, that kind of reminds us a little bit of Israel, by the way, where where they're a little bit controlling when it comes to the farming. But outside of outside of farming, uh, entrepreneurship is highly encouraged in Japan. And that's one of the reasons why their economy is so good. Next up is India. So India leans slightly more, uh, slightly more market than command. Um, uh, in your reading, India was at about 54% uh, on the economic freedom line. They're probably a little bit closer to 60 in reality. So, you know, a little bit more market than command. Um, their main areas of production, uh, a lot of agriculture, they, they produce, uh, there's a lot of agriculture there, a lot of technology, okay, and a lot of information services, okay, an awful lot of the information services talent in the world is based out of India. Um, one of the main things that India relies upon on how to produce is the fact that they do have these educated workers. Um, they're highly educated workers. And by the way, um, most of these educated workers speak English. So that makes them very useful in terms of um, being able to um, provide technology services for, well, places like the United States and other English speaking uh, countries. Um, for whom to produce? Well, they do export a lot to China. Uh, they be, China's nearby. Um, a lot of business with the UK because, well, they used to be a colony of the British and, of course, the United States. Uh, these are all major trading partners of India. Um, as for the role of entrepreneurs, uh, India, by the way, does have a booming economy. They do have a, a very successful economy. They would be able to do better if they were more welcoming to entrepreneurs. It's not that they don't want entrepreneurship, but there's um, a lot of government rules in India that make it difficult for entrepreneurs to, to do their jobs, makes it difficult for them to open a business. And there's a certain amount of corruption there as well. Some various government officials who might demand bribes from entrepreneurs. So uh, that's, that's an area that India really needs to work on. But... Um, Overall, though, India has one of the booming economies. Overall, India's economy is doing pretty well. They'd be doing better uh, if they made a couple changes, but overall, they're doing well. North Korea, well, <laughs> North Korea is special. Um, for type of mixed economy, they are mostly command. In fact, they are the closest to being a pure command economy of any country in the world. They are the last genuinely communist country left in the world, communist government, communist economy. Um, Cuba is still uh, technically communist in both of those areas, but Cuba has been moving away from communist economics. Cuba is closer to you know, 15, 20% on the economic continuum line, while North Korea is solidly there at about 5%. Um, their production is focused on, well, food uh, and, and military weapons, and they're not doing a very good job on the food, by the way. Um, because of the nature of their dictatorship, they're really focused on trying to maintain the dictator's power. So that's why uh, the military weapons. Um, how to produce, of course, they're using government-run farms, government-run factories uh, because of the pure, you know, well, almost pure command economy there. Um, for whom to produce, they, they do have a small amount of trade. They have uh, a small amount of trade with South Korea, interestingly enough. Uh, some trade with China, some trade with India. Really, their their biggest trading partner would be China, but they're not trading a whole lot 
uh, with any of these countries. And by the way, the role of entrepreneurship, none, none. It is illegal to be an entrepreneurship in a command economy. So um, it is, you are not allowed to be uh, an entrepreneur in North Korea. On to China. Now China, again, while they do have a, they, they still adhere to a communist state as their system of government, they don't really follow communist philosophy in terms of their economy. So um, China is actually beyond the 50% line. They are leaning slightly more market than command, uh, about 52% according to your reading. So what produces, well, manufactured goods of all kinds. Um, China has industrialized heavily in the last couple of decades. And China is the place with all the factories. China is the place where all of our stuff is produced. Okay, the, the consumer goods, the, the factory goods of the world are largely produced in China. Just take, just take a look at the labels on, any, on the things you own. Most of the stuff you own, made in China. Um, how produced now, China has a huge workforce. They have a huge workforce. They are the most populous country in the world. Lots and lots of workers in China. And so they have a very large workforce. And because of the size, those workers, uh, for the most part, don't need to be paid as much as they do in other countries. So you have this massive workforce and you have this hugely well-developed uh, system of factories over there. So while um, a Chinese company can you know, can be given a product to produce, can be asked to, you know, a design, they can, they can start cranking out a new product within a month or two, um, while other countries, it might take uh, a year to start uh, ramp up production on, on a new product. Um, their main trading partners are the United States, Japan, and others, and others, a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of countries are trading with China. Um, the role of entrepreneurs actually do encourage entrepreneurship. There are a lot of there are a lot of laws, and the Communist Party uh, can can get in the way. But entrepreneurship is actually encouraged in China. All right. So um, why don't we take a look at the economic continuum line on your page? Now you remember on the far left end of the line is going to be where you have a pure command economy and on the far right is pure market economy and no country belongs all the way at one end or the other. Um, even North Korea is not a pure command economy, but if we were to go from left to right here, um, the, the lowest one, with the, the country with the least economic freedom would be North Korea, somewhere around about five on our economic continuum line. Next up is China. China is just past the middle point, so at about 52%. Then comes India, 54% uh, according to your reading, maybe a little bit closer, probably a little bit closer to 60% uh, nowadays. And Japan over here around 73%.